It's estimated that at any given moment, there's half a million predators online and their purpose is to exploit and manipulate these children. Awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be together and excited to have Tyson Wright with us this week. I've been looking forward to this conversation, not, uh, not necessarily a pleasant conversation, but an important conversation that has become uh, more and more uh, urgent, I think, for us and the world we live in as the threats to our families and the folks around us increase. Uh, it's just important for us to take time and improve our awareness and uh, and understand the things we can do to help those around us be safe. And one of the organizations I ran across a few months ago was Operation Underground Railroad, which is very involved in helping children caught in sex trafficking and sexual abuse uh, operations. And so I asked for uh, Tyson to come spend some time with us and talk about the work they do to help kids and, and hurt the bad guys. And i um, excited to learn about that. But I want to go way back, Tyson. Let's talk about your, uh, your early upbringing and who inspired you. Uh, what, what led you down this path of this nonprofit and service world that you're in today? What are some of the early lessons and inspirations in your life that brought you to where you are today? One of the biggest things I would say is, is uh, just a culture of service that I grew up in uh, with my family and my community. Uh, it was always looking to help other people. And that was an important part and integral to my development over the years uh, in an orientation of giving back. And it's always been something that's very important to me. Uh, before I worked for OUR, I volunteered for them for six years doing similar to what I do now as I work for them, but helping to raise awareness to this fact. Um, so there's a lot of different individuals who helped me understand the importance of being selfless and giving and looking for opportunities to support others who might be less fortunate than us. Uh, and it's been a mainstay of my life and, and brought me such pleasure and joy as I've gone about doing that. Well, that's awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about Operation Underground Railroad and uh, some of the work you do and some of the things that we ought to know about the work that you're doing. And uh, then maybe we can dive into what's going on all around us. Okay. So Operation Underground Railroad is uh, we're a nonprofit organization. And our main goal to sum it up in one sentence is we exist to rescue women and children from human trafficking. And that looks different no matter where we operate in the world. We operate in the United States and support law enforcement here. And we support governments and law enforcement internationally as, as well in their efforts in fighting human trafficking. Everywhere in the world, it looks different depending on the culture and society and what's prevalent there. Uh, human trafficking, to kind of sum it up uh, in an easy way to understand, it's uh, often we have a misconception of what human trafficking really is. And we get so focused on the second term of trafficking. And we envision that it entails movement, that it entails someone being kidnapped, thrown in a van, locked up in chains, transported to another country. And where that does happen, that's not the most common form of human trafficking. That's not how it looks like in most cases. So human trafficking, as defined by most places in the world, is the use of fraud, coercion, uh, or manipula a manipulation to force someone into either a act of labor or a commercial sex act. So in the world, human trafficking usually falls into those two categories, labor trafficking, some forcing someone to work, or sex trafficking, forcing someone to perform a commercial sex act. There's someone paying for that act, but they're not choosing to, um, to perform that act themselves. We focus primarily and hone in on child sex trafficking is where we do a lot of our work. We were started in 2013 
by a gentleman named Tim Ballard. At the time, before he uh, started OUR, he was a federal agent with Homeland Security Investigations. Uh, he had worked with the CIA as well. And he was investigating human trafficking cases on a federal level. He was down on the border in Southern California and was investigating a lot of cases there, uh, especially some that were coming across the border at the time. And he realized that there was too much red tape. A lot of the cases he was investigating at the time had ties or origination across the border. And he could do some work in helping to investigate those, but he could only go so far. And he found that he was limited. And there was two cases that he was working at this time, one in Colombia and one in Haiti. And he couldn't do anything to, you know, carry the case all the way out to prosecution. He was limited. So he had to come to a decision. Either I continue, I give up on these cases, I, I put them out of my mind and I move on, or I leave my job, I leave the government, and in essence, I privatize the rescuing of children. And that's what he did. And he started uh, Operation Underground Railroad with the goal to rescue children who are trapped in human trafficking. And we go about it in a unique way. Um, there's a lot of organizations, a lot of great organizations that focus on prevention and education, awareness, which are all very important and, and will get widespread change with those. But we use our understanding, our skills, our knowledge, abilities that we have to actually go in in foreign countries and working with those governments and law enforcement we helped perform undercover sting operations to convince traffickers to bring children or those that are being trafficked to a meet. And we bring law enforcement with us. Once we make an exchange of money with those individuals, law enforcement comes in and makes an arrest of those traffickers. And we take those, those survivors of human trafficking and we start them on their healing journey through our aftercare programs to get them the, the support, the healing that they need, uh, help them get where they want to get in life. And we can talk more about that later, but that's kind of a quick sum up of, of what we do. We also support law enforcement here in the United States. It looks different. We don't participate in investigations and undercover operations here in the United States, but we provide the resources that law enforcement need um, so often they have budget shortcomings, um, and human trafficking investigations take proactive effort. Uh, they're not as much of a reactive investigation. Uh, they can be, but to really make a difference, they're proactive and it takes technology. It takes training. It takes equipment to do that. And a lot of times, uh, law enforcement and police departments don't have the resources to get that materials, those technology pieces that they need. So we help to provide those to police departments here in the United States as well. So it's a quick sum up of what we do. So while it looks different here in the US, I would assume that the activity level is still just as high and the threat is still just as high. You know, what's the uh, awareness we should have of what's going on just even here around us? Yeah. You know, this, this is one of those categories that falls into with most sexual crimes that exist. It's hard to get a real grasp because it's so underreported. People don't report these cases. Um, we're just beginning to understand the scope of the problem. But it's estimated that there's 25 million individuals trapped in human trafficking right at this very moment around the world. Um, human trafficking has been reported, cases has been in, investigated and prosecuted in every state in the United States. Um, it exists in every community, every town. Um, the Polaris Project is another nonprofit, and they run the human trafficking hotline that individuals can call into and report to. Um, they get, I can't remember the exact number, but it was somewhere, I think, around 20,000 reports last year alone 
um, which was an increase of two or three hundred percent from years previous. Um, so it exists here in the United States just like it does everywhere else. But a main difference and, and kind of a disturbing difference here in the United States and, and worldwide that we don't understand as a, as a society and a community. Again, like I mentioned, we focus on that second term of trafficking and we envision movement and we envision someone being tied up or bound and, and imprisoned. And again, that's not always the case. Uh, the statistic is that 40% of all human trafficking begins or continues with a familial connection. It's a family member who's the individual who sold uh, that, that person in the first place or is continually trafficking them. So often, especially here in the United States, um, when it comes to children especially, that child is living what, what might look like a normal life. They're going to school, they go and see the dentist, they go to the doctor, they play with their friends after school some days, but they're being trafficked by an individual, sometimes even right out of their own home in a lot of cases. So it's, it's prevalent here and everywhere. There's nowhere exempt, uh, big, big city or small little town, there's been cases reported. How much of the way these predators get to kids is right in what we're handing them in their phone? How much is it people, I've talked to law enforcement here about how they use gaming apps and things like that yeah. to build relationships. What, what's your research and what's your work revealed about that of just even the video games and the chat rooms that we're letting our kids in? How much is that a problem? It's an extreme problem. And one that we've, we've enabled without even knowing it with some of our reactions over the last couple of years to the, to the COVID pandemic, we took our children and, and they came out of school in, in early on. We gave them all a device and said, you're gonna do your schoolwork online. And uh, the problem with that was a great idea. We can continue some education but there wasn't an oversight connected to it. The parents still had to go to work or you know, do their thing. Um, teachers were remote as well. And so in a lot of cases, it was a kid by themselves on a device for all day, eight hours a day, as they were just doing their homework. And then in addition to that, any other time that they spent on their devices of their personal time. The next piece that also played into that is businesses shut down and you know, workers went remote. And the predators who are doing this, these things are not unemployed individuals. They're not the, the bums on the side of the street. They're just like everyone else. They're accountants, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're IT individuals. They're normal individuals, these predators. And so we took these individuals and said, hey, you work remote as well. And we put a vulnerable child and a predator with a life online where they're, they are no longer going to school and being separate from that, they're online. Uh, an employee has the opportunity to sit unsupervised at home on their computer all day long. And we created this place reports of online solicitation and exploitation skyrocketed over uh, 2020 and 2021. They took off multiplying again by two or 300% with the reports of exploitation online. It's estimated that at, at any given moment, there's half a million predators online and their purpose is to exploit and manipulate these children. And it happens on any sort of device, on any sort of social media site, any sort of game or app. In our heads, we go to the ones that we're most common with. We go to Facebook, Instagram. We go to games like Fortnite and Call of Duty, and it exists there. But it can even happen on a child's game that has any sort of connectivity to the internet. We've found games that are to help learn the ABCs 
and they have some sort of connectivity or chat function. And those have been used to exploit and gain access to children. We don't have the protections in place when it comes to these things on our devices that we're giving to our children and we're setting them up and allowing them to be so vulnerable online. And then we don't know enough about what's out there and we don't understand enough about the ways and the resources and the things that these predators are doing to exploit our children online. And we fall into this false sense of security thinking oh, I've put on some privacy or I've got some firewalls. Well, first off, these predators are a lot smarter than we are in a lot of cases when it comes to technology. And our children are most definitely smarter than us when it comes to technology and getting around those workarounds. Uh, so often we, we come across this and parents say, well, I had privacy on and I had this and their kids were able to work around that privacy. Their kids created something as simple as their kids created a second account that their parents didn't know about. Um, and then it was in that situation that they were uh, solicited and manipulated and eventually exploited. Yeah, I was talking to some law enforcement officers that tell me these people's strategy is to get into these games or these game chat apps like Discord and pretend to be another gamer. And you're yep. just having conversations about the game, but then it's, Hey, let's go set up this private room where just you and I can share tips or something. And exactly. so they can, they can lure the kids off to where no one can see what they're doing. Yep. And when, when, you know, I was growing up and you guys were growing up, it was stranger danger. And you watched out for the guy on the street in a van. And as long as you didn't help him find his dog and take candy from him, you were safe. You could avoid it. You knew where the danger was and you knew what it looked like. And that guy, he was limited by what he could do by the kids who were around him. And the time limit was much shorter that he had. He had to act quick. Well, now that guy, he sold his van online. He got rid of it. He bought himself a computer and he sits in his house and he has access to tens of thousands of children who come back every single day to play a game, to get on social media, to connect with the world in that way. That's how our children and younger generations are connecting to the world is online. And they return every single day. This individual, this predator, no, no longer has to worry about time constraints. He can take or she can take as long as they want to groom this child. They can catfish, meaning they can use and create hundreds of different profiles, being whoever they feel like they need to be to build a relationship with this child. If, it's, if they're trying to groom a young boy, they might use a profile that's another young boy. They might use a profile that's a young girl or a girl that's a little older or a little younger. They can pick who they want to be online and they can try one out. And if the kid doesn't respond, they can try another one. And we, and the kid comes back the next day and is vulnerable the next day. They're, they're present the next day online. And this predator just has to sit and wait. And they can take as long as they want to do this grooming process. In some cases, they take months and months to build a relationship with this kid online. And then they might introduce them to some friends that they have online, which at the end is really just the same predator operating another profile. And now they're communicating with this kid through multiple people. And the kid thinks, oh, this guy has friends online and now we're building a community and we're building trust when it's all just a single predator manipulating this child through multiple profiles online. Um, and, and they ultimately try to get to a private setting if that's a private chat or they move it off of that game to you know, Snapchat or even texting if they can. And then they start to try to ask for explicit content. They'll ask for images, they'll ask for videos. They'll send videos or images of themselves to that child to make them feel like they're trapped, make them feel guilty. Uh, if, if they sent, you know, if the child sent an image, even if it's not inappropriate and exploitive, they'll use that and say, well, 
if you don't send me another image, I'm going to tell your parents or I'm going to post this all over all all online and uh, you're going to feel embarrassed because I'll share this with everyone. So give me another picture and slowly and slowly they manipulate these children to exploit them for content. Now, I will say here that a lot of this that I've described would fall under online exploitation or solicitation, depending on the state and what was said, it could cross into human trafficking, but most of this up to this stage does not is not actual human trafficking until certain parameters are met. Again, human trafficking is the this, this sale of an individual for a sex act. And so um, when it crosses the human trafficking is if they ever do meet in person. And, and you think, well, why would a kid ever meet someone online? It happens quite often that they meet someone online, they set up um, and they think that they have a, re a relationship, they think that they're friends, they think that they're in love. So they actually, it happens often that kids will meet up with an individual that they've met online. And then at that point is, is when, if they sell them or exploit them for a commercial sex act is when it becomes human trafficking. In some states though, I will say, online solicitation and depending on what they're soliciting from a minor can be prosecuted as human trafficking. Mostly I feel like I want to throw up. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's because this is hard to even imagine. Um, Steve had asked a question here about the size. I think maybe he answered that Steve, but, but did, was there any more you wanted to know about that? Just about the size of this problem? Uh, no, no, I think the, that question was answered. So thank you. Okay. Okay. So there's another, there's another question that came in that's related to this. That was a direct one, but I feel like I'll answer it here. Cause I feel many of you are probably wondering this question. What can we do to help protect our kids? We, and, and that's, that's where I love to focus. And we have to talk about this this first part, we have to build up what human trafficking is and understand how prevalent of a problem it is and how real of a problem it is. And that's the hard part to talk about. That's the tough part. That's where it puts a pit in your stomach. It makes you want to curl up in the corner and let your kids never leave the house again, or your grandkids never leave the house again and have a device. And that's an important piece. We need to understand the problem. But it's not hopeless. There, there's not, it, the world isn't over, it's not ended. It's, there's terrible things that happen, but there are things that we can do to help to protect our kids, especially when it comes to online and what they're doing there. Number one thing is be present in your kids' online life and in their social life. That means having access to their accounts, having access to see what they're doing online. It doesn't mean that they're not gonna have workarounds and they're gonna try to overcome it and, and block it out or change a password or delete messages or delete posts, but a present is the number one defense in being present online. Number two is being present as a parent overall and starting this conversation. No kid, wants to be exploited. No kid goes online thinking, hey, I'm gonna talk to a fake person and they're gonna manipulate me today. That's not what they're thinking. What they're going online to get is connection, relationship, a feeling of belonging. That's what they're going for. They're, they, they're looking for those places. And with the removal of so many in-person social connections over the last two years, online is one of the only places to find that, especially for a kid. And there's that dynamic of a parent-child relationship that there's ah, oh, there's this angst in a lot of in a lot of cases, and it's built and it's hard. But we need to start the conversations early, early on in our child's lives or whenever we can. If this is the first time that we've talked about it, it's now that we start these relationships. 
It's helping them understand what exists out there at an age appropriate level. I have a four year old. I'm not going to go and tell her everything that I've told you today. But my four year old knows appropriately how to protect herself. And that starts with at a young age with what's safe and what's unsafe. It's not diving into human trafficking. It's not diving into sexual exploitation and abuse, but it's building up those conversations of how do you keep yourself safe? How do you recognize what's safe and unsafe? How do, how I'm going to portray to her why this is important to me because it's keeping her safe and not unsafe. And so it's having a conversation, a very open and frank conversation about why it's important that our kids are safe online. You would be appalled if you saw the messages that come into children online without any solicitation, without anything that the child has done. Predators will send explicit pornographic images right away, number one message. They'll ask for explicit acts right away, number one message. The predators are bold. The predators are taking steps of being bold and straightforward that we as parents aren't. We're afraid to go to our kids and tell them that these things exist online, to tell them, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help monitor your social media because I care about you, because I love you, because there's people doing these things. As parents, we're intimidated to do that in a lot of cases, and we don't want to do that. But the predators are doing it. They're straight, bold, right in the kid's face. We need to match that boldness in love and understanding. We need to also understand, and, and this, can, this can get really far down, down. There's a lot to talk about this, but we, can, we need to understand what the threats look like and how they are, how they how these predators are exploiting our children online. We think, for example, on Instagram, if I make my account private, that I'm safe, I'm secure from the world, no one can see my pictures, no one can know anything about me. And that's just not the case. A predator, again, because they have time, can build a profile of a child through investigating on Instagram without a lot of work. They can see, for example, what an individual has liked. I can go to a picture online and I can look at it and right underneath it says 2000 people have liked this image. I can click on that and I can see every single profile that has liked that image. And I can make notes and I can go, oh look, that's a cute little girl there. And she liked this picture of a dog. Well, the next time I see, and again, I have no rush, I see another picture of a dog and this same girl liked this image. And now I'm starting to build an understanding that this little girl likes dogs. So another flaw of, of Instagram, for example, is that anyone can direct message anyone. It doesn't matter what your privacy settings are. So then can come the day of, uh, well, imagine that I, I continue to see this girl and I realize, oh, look, she, she likes this, you know, another little girl's picture. Maybe they're friends. Um, and I could build this profile. So one day this predator says, okay, I'm going to reach out to this girl. And he has a profile. She's, she you knows that she has these friends that are this age. And so that's the profile I'm going to use. I know she likes dogs. So I'm going to maybe send her a picture of a dog and say, don't you think this picture is cute? I love dogs. Don't you love dogs? And slowly build this relationship with this child. All while us as parents think my kid's safe online because their account on Instagram is private and no one can know anything about them because it's private. So we need to understand what these social media platforms, that, what security is there, and then what the workarounds and ways to get around those securities are because they do exist. Let's go over to Drew because Drew and Libby, I think, have some similar questions. And is this just a kid thing or is anybody vulnerable? Drew, why don't you ask? 
Yeah, yeah, Tyson. Thank you so much. This is unbelievable. I mean, I, I, I good, you know, good people need to wake up to some of these things. My question, um, even when you walk, I'll use it as a, an analogy. I've walked into an airport and I've seen a bag sitting alone, nobody near it, uh, and nobody recognizes it. Nobody cares about it, and nobody says anything to the authorities. There could be something in that bag, and it's sitting there alone. The same thing goes in this. We don't have kids anymore, at least my kids are, are you know, 20, 24, 27, and 30. Um, so what do we do um, as members of a community to protect not only ourselves, but our, fam our families and our family's friends? Because I think there's, there's sort of a disconnect uh, from my perspective of, you know, we, I'm not around little kids anymore, so I don't yeah. see what they're doing. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So the same things for a, a young child to an adult. We we just rescued our oldest survivor. And I don't know, like I just drew a blank on the exact number, but over 80, 82 or 83 years old. We just rescued our oldest survivor of human trafficking in the last six months or so. And the 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 thing is not age. That's not where most people fall into it. Now that is that does create a pro problem because especially when you come to sex trafficking, there's this group of individuals who want to have sex with children. And, and so they're creating this demand. And actually the United States, Americans are the largest driving factor. We are the demand for child sex trafficking. And it's terrible and we need to change it. We exploit that by doing our undercover operations, we have an American face. We can go into these foreign countries and traffickers believe that we're there to buy children for sex because it happens every day. But what's being exploited are vulnerabilities. That's where someone's being exploited. They, they don't have the food that they need. They're living in poverty. They don't have a house. They don't they don't meet those very basics. We go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And that's where these traffickers and predators are exploiting individuals is trying to feel those vulnerabilities and those needs that they have. A lot of individuals, the number one thing worldwide that someone gets exploited on is poverty. They don't have the money that they need to feed themselves, their families. They don't, they don't have a place to live. And because of that, they get tricked into things like, hey, here's a great job. Come and work here. And then it's not a real job at a hotel. It's being sold for sex. Poverty is a, a huge piece. Then that need for longing, like I mentioned, if after that first level of, of needs are filled, the next one turns to emotional needs, love, connection, belonging, relationship. And that's the next level. And that's where you're gonna cross over to us, individuals here in America. We have poverty, yes, but most people are doing okay here in the United States. And that's probably where your kids fall or your grandkids fall is they're doing okay, but they're still vulnerable because of needs that they have. We just, here in Utah, just a few months ago, there was a 21 year old girl at school, uh, she had moved away from her family and into a small town, smaller town at this little community college going to school. Uh, she had some mental health issues and uh, she met a guy online and they became friends and, and uh, they became boyfriend, girlfriend, never met in life at all. And they, they built this relationship and um, he filled the needs that she had, that need of connection because she had moved away from home, that need for a relationship, uh, helping with some of those anxiety and depression needs, filling that gap. Well, eventually they met in person. He took her and uh, took her to a house in another county and kept her trapped there for seven days and raped her repeatedly. And, and uh, she was a 21, 22 year old girl. So it wasn't just a little kid. The age isn't what fully matters. That's where our focus is. That's where we do a lot of our work. But what's happening is individuals are being exploited because of these vulnerabilities or needs that they have that aren't being met. 
number one thing that we can do, especially with an older group, is educate them. Help them understand that this exists. Like I mentioned and, and was mentioned early on, this isn't a topic that people love to talk about. If you put up a sign out front that said, come and learn about human trafficking, or a sign next door that said, come and get ice cream, more people are going to get ice cream. There's a lot of things people would rather do than come and learn about human trafficking. And we create in some ways the space for human, human trafficking to exist because we don't want to open our eyes to it, because we don't want to accept it and educate each other and talk about it. So letting your grown children know what human trafficking is, what it looks like, what the vulnerabilities are, is step number one and a big step in helping them keep themselves safe. Joel, I believe you uh, raised your hand, didn't you? Yeah, very perceptive, Randy. Um, Tyson, thanks for, for all you do. I, I wanted to just bring something up and then have you comment on it because I, I've been fortunate enough, I uh, among many things, host a podcast um, really about leadership, but um, I've, I've had guests about this topic, uh, including a four-part series on it. And what I wanted you to comment on, because I think it'll surprise a lot of people, um, I interviewed a survivor um, who I think now is probably in her thirties. Um, I actually, she's got really bad health now, um, because of all the physical and mental abuse that she took. I know you see those stories a lot, What shocked me. And she didn't want to talk a whole lot about it, uh, on camera is that she was trafficked at a very young age by her father. And that one would surprise a lot of people. Although you just mentioned the, um, you know, the profit, the money side of this or the, the um, financial status uh, poverty, I think you said. Um, and I, I wanted you to talk about that because I think that there are elements of that that truly go on in front of our eyes every single day. And, and back to your original point that um, th this isn't always just someone being moved from place to place, or I think we think of trafficking being someone chained to a bed in a basement. And yet this woman or girl at the time was going to school every day and back. And that there is an element of these people being right in front of our eyes in public. So it couldn't possibly be happening. So I'm wondering if you could talk about that and just some of the signs that people can look for that might be going on in front of their eyes. Yeah. And, and again, the statistic is 40% of all human trafficking has a familial connection. It's a family member who's involved. Um, and that could be a mom, that could be a dad, that could be a grandparent, an uncle. It, it, it's not always just the parent who's doing it. Um, and then there's also the side of a romantic relationship where it's a boyfriend or a spouse, uh, this significant other that's the trafficker as well. So often it's someone the survivor knows. It's not always just some random person who's trafficking them. There's usually a connection and a familial connection to that. And, and like was said, they live a normal life. They still go to school. They, they still go and see the doctor. They go and they're doing all the normal things that a kid would do. And so you look and you think, well, there's nothing wrong there, but they're being trafficked so often right out of their own house. And, it, and we see it all the time that that happens. Um, some of the signs that can help us is to, to understand and connect those. Um, it's important to know that these signs aren't specific to human trafficking. It's hard to identify. There are some, but it's hard to identify a list of specific human trafficking signs because Human trafficking at the end of the day is so, it is sexual abuse and sexual assault. So as I talk about some of these, not all of them are, this is just straight human trafficking, but what we can do is take some of these pieces and see four or five red flags and think, okay, there's something more going on and it's possibly human trafficking. If you come to the conclusion that something's going on, still report it. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if it was human trafficking or if it was a kid being abused, the report was made and the kid was helped. That's what matters at the end of the day. So it's not like you get a bigger gold star if it was human trafficking versus something else. 
a report is a report if it helps an individual. But a lot of a lot of things that you'll see in a child, um, especially a child, but this happens with anyone, is extreme changes in personality. You have a kid who is happy, who is outgoing, um, and now they're reserved and they don't they don't connect, they don't talk, they are just only with themselves. They're on their phone or their tablet or their device all the time. In a lot of cases, connecting and talking to their trafficker, if it's not a family member or if it's someone else, but they become more reserved and they become more connected to that trafficker. It's a weird anomaly that you think of, like why would that person's abusing them? But again, that person manipulated them on a need and they feel like that need is being met in a lot of cases. We often get the idea and people think that if we show up, law enforcement show up with open, open arms, that the survivors are going to come running out and say, rescue me. That's not always the case because they have been manipulated. They have been exploited. So they don't often see that this is wrong completely. They don't often see, they think, oh, this is normal. This is what everyone else is doing too. So they don't often see it. So they'll have a connection to their trafficker and they might try to spend more time with them or be around them. They'll be more reserved. Um, a lot of times they'll be, uh, in, in cases, there'll be an increase of tangible things, an increase in new clothing, an increase in cell phones, an increase in, uh, devices, the things that the trafficker will use to bribe them or continue to manipulate them to think, oh yeah, he does care about me. He got me a new dress or they got me a new phone and they, they care about me. And that just happened the other day. That was a one-time thing when he sold me to his friend, but he loves me. So they'll use these tangible things to manipulate that individual. If you ever come across a, a survivor uh, with their trafficker, in a lot of cases, that survivor will be very submissive to their trafficker. If you ask them a question, oftentimes they'll turn to the trafficker to answer the question instead of asking it, even if it's specifically about the survivor. They might, in a lot of cases, have downturned eyes and not make eye contact and look at the ground and just avoid the situation. Again, it leads back to a manipulation tactic in, in a lot of cases. If they look at someone, they smile at someone, the trafficker later will say, what were you doing? Why are you trying to make contact with them? And they'll abuse them and they'll beat them and they'll enforce that they're in charge based on interactions. So a lot of times survivors will just avoid any social interactions, especially when they're around their trafficker and just try to be there and not present at all. You'll have these signs of abuse, such as broken arms, bruises, um, in children, if they have any sort of STD, it, it, no child should ever have an STD. It's a good sign of what's happening if they do. Um, there's emotional damages that happen. There's depression, there's anxiety, there's thoughts of suicide. And again, not all of these are specifically connected to human trafficking, but you can see that if you connect a few of these together, you could the red flags could pop up of something's happening here and it could be human trafficking that is happening. Jump down to Lindsay if she's there, because I think her question kind of sums up what's the unimaginative nature of this. Are you there, Lindsay? I am here. You want to ask your question here? Let me, sorry, I've got too many screens going up. Oh. Um, you had mentioned that sometimes it was the dad um, or a boyfriend that is, you know, basically leading this trafficking for their child. How, how does that even, what does that look like? Is it a dad or a boyfriend saying you're going to go have sex with someone or you're going to send me a picture or, and I assume this is starting with molestation at home. And then it, mm -hmm. it goes further from that. But yep. can you tell me how this comes about? I think uh, the most important piece that we have to we have to understand and remove from our head in this situation from their point is the care and love for that child. They 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 don't often have that same what you're thinking in your head right now, Lindsay is 
is I have kids or I wouldn't, I could never do that to my own child. That's not at the forefront of their head is that love and care that it's, it's a financial gain in a lot of cases. Human trafficking is estimated to bring in an $150 billion annually. It's, it's a money driven industry. There's money to be made in the industry. And that's what the number one focus is for these traffickers is making money off of, off of selling their kids. And so with a boyfriend, it might start with something like, hey, we're short on rent. We don't have enough money to make rent or we can't buy groceries next week. My, my friend, he'll pay us a hundred bucks if you have sex with him. And it might start with something like that. Um, and then the next week, another friend is willing to pay and the next week and the next week. And then, then more manipulation happens and traps happen and abuse happens um, that then traps that individual in with their boyfriend. Um, from a parent standpoint, it, it starts at such a young age. And again, probably starts with some other sort of uh, sexual abuse before that. And this child probably has been manipulated to a false understanding of what love is and what that parent-child relationship is. And so they might think, yeah, this is, we, we've had survivors say that they thought that what was happening to them was normal. They thought that that's what kids did. And they didn't talk about it at school because it was embarrassing and weird, but they were going to school, they were doing all that, and they thought, this is what kids do, this is life. And uh, they, they just, it's the relationship isn't the relationship that we think of when we think of a parent-child relationship. It's so off and skewed um, when, it, when that happens with a, with a parent trafficking out of their own house or trafficking their own child in some way. Is it similar to what we grew up on uh, that we would call a pimp? per se in some cases. Yeah, yeah, and okay. in some ways, and, and we have that, we have that, um, you know, a pimp. And for some reason that's like an acceptable term. And, and in some generations and cultures, it's been like cool to be a pimp. At the end of the day, they're a trafficker. They're selling an individual, they're forcing someone to have sex and give them money for that, what they're having. And that's an illegal act in so many cases. Most prostitution has this similar re relationship. It's a trafficker, call them a pimp, call them whatever you want, manipulating an individual to have sex with someone else for a commercial gain. You know, there's some places the prostitution is legal, but with, there's statistics and, and studies done by a number of different organizations that legalizing prostitution leads to an increase of sex trafficking because not every woman wants to have sex, even if it's legal, they don't want to have sex for money. That's not what they want to do for their job. So if it's legal and they can do it, well, then there's more manipulation and force from a trafficker because it's a legal way of making money in sense by prostitution. So when prostitution's legalized, sex, human trafficking and sex trafficking increases in those areas. A lot of people think and the idea, I think, behind what they say of legalizing it is that it will reduce that, but it actually increases it on the other side. Let's go to uh, Carolyn. Thank you, Randy. Uh, I'm on video today just because there's chaos in my house. Um, otherwise, I would, I would be virtually looking you in the eye, Tyson, to say thank you. You know, the work yeah. you're doing, I have uh, two questions on. One, you know, you talked about social media and that's vital. So, you know, Snapchat, understanding it, even if you don't use it is vital. My first question is, could you speak a little bit about cell phones and people you, kids you love, sorry, I'm lifting things, <laughs> kids you love, people you love, um, looking at their cell phones because oftentimes, as you said, they're asking for pictures. Maybe that's done on the Snapchat um, app. Maybe it's done on the phone. And if you can get those pictures and show it to authorities, the possibility of them being um, gotten for the distribution or acceptance of child pornography is there. Can you speak to that a little bit? And the second thing, can you speak to 
action steps. You know, we're, we're, you're talking about how somebody might look and I'm thinking of all the people I, I traveling for a living or even being out in the world and seeing something that their gut just doesn't feel right. What suggestions would you make to folks on how to act in that situation and how to get the authorities involved? Because I think some people think, well, wait, what if I'm wrong? When chances are, you could be very, very right. And you mm-hmm. having an action step could be the difference between that child or that person getting assistance or continuing to being trafficked and that person building a bigger network of children to traffic. So those are my two questions, sir. I'd love to get your your answers on that. Yeah. So from a um, kind of wider, more comments way of connecting with the child, it is mostly done on social medias, games, those types of things, which can be done on a cell phone. But as far as, you know, a lot doesn't happen. Phishing scams, catfishing doesn't happen as it doesn't happen as often with just like a straight text message phishing scam like that or something. Um, but it usually starts on a on an app, on a game, on something like that. And then they do try to get off of those games to some more uh, protected things like Snapchat, where it deletes after a time, or WhatsApp, where it's encrypted. Um, so they, they do try to move to other forms of communication off of those games or apps where they first make that initial contact and conversation. So it is important to um, not only just watch the social media, but look at the other device, other things that are on the phone, other apps, text messages, Snapchats, things like that, other avenues, because they will transition from those more public ways of communicating down to more private ways of communicating that are less monitorable and and less discoverable and more encrypted or protected in some cases um, with their messaging. So it's important to watch all of it. If you do come across um, an image that has been sent either way, number one thing, do not send it to anyone else. Just hold on to it. It, especially if it's um, of a child exploitation material of a child, do not send it. You, I don't, you probably wouldn't be prosecuted for it, but at that point by hitting send, you've now distributed child pornography, even if you're sending it to a police officer. So do not send it, do not delete it, just keep it and, and take it and report it. When it comes to reporting, if it involves a minor, call 911 right away, no matter where you're at, call 911 if it involves a minor so that they can help right away. There is also the human trafficking hotline that can be called, run 24 hours, uh, seven days a week across the entire United States. The phone number for that is 1-888-3737-888. So 888-3737-888. Um, And you can report there. You can report something that happened a week ago. You can report something that happened days ago. If you think, "Ah, I still just don't feel good about what I saw and what what happened the other day at the airport in another town where I was, it still just doesn't fit. You can call the hotline, give them whatever information you can give them uh, so that they can get little breadcrumbs. And so often with this, it's little breadcrumbs. It's not always, here's the whole thing, it all spreads out, but little pieces. And they, it might've been at a gas station that you noticed something in a town you traveled through the other day. You call the human traffic hot, hotline. They connect it with a few other reports at that same gas station, or they get it to the police in the community and say, this came in and they connect it with some information that they have that might be the piece, even though it might seem so small, that maybe takes something, an investigation to the next level. So you can always report. You can report even if it happened in a previous time. There's no expiration saying, oh, that happened a day ago. We're not going to take your report. So you can always report if you feel something suspicious is happening. Let's go to Kurt. Yeah, just again, thank you very much. Um, this has been enlightening. And, and 
educating me. I must be Mr. Naive. Um, and I see this spectrum, and I've heard of human trafficking, right, Tyson? But I didn't know the extent. And it's all logical the way you draw in from kids to, as Libby mentioned, our parents, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to be trafficked, but they get sucked into scams as well. I, I'm wondering, is there a resource, whether it be a one or five minute video or something. And again, thanks to guys like Joel who do the podcasts that help educate people. But is there something that we could show kids or grandparents or ourselves such that we raise an awareness without getting pissed at someone or making them feel intimidated because they've been sucked in before because we've all made errors and mistakes? Because I think if there's an awareness that hey, this rabbit hole, or here are the perils of going down, of wanting to be liked by someone you don't even know on social media or some connection like that. Is there, is there, is there a simple way to educate and help others, I guess, is the summary of my question. Yeah, I can send some resources and some links to Randy that then he could send out to the group uh, after this. But there's also a number of other great nonprofits. We know that that human trafficking is such a giant problem and we're just one organization we're not going to be able to solve this like it needs to be solved by ourselves we need to do this with other organizations so we partner with a, a number of not other nonprofits to help in this area some of the, the the big ones that focus on the education and awareness are the polaris project uh they're a big one and they're the they're the group that actually runs the human trafficking hotline so Polaris Project is, is a big one. Um, the uh, NCOSE, it's, the, it's a N-C-O-S-E. It's uh, short for the National Center on um, Sexual Ex Exploitation, NCOSE. They, they're another big player in this field. And they work a lot on uh, court cases and legislation, changing that and, and helping survivors in court cases. Um, there's, I just forgot their name. It'll come to me. Um, so there's a number of, of organizations that uh, deal uh, heavier in education, but we have some resources that I'll send to Randy as well after. We also are just rolling out a new program that goes into schools and educates children in schools. And it's a, it's a K through 12 program. And it is not walking into a kindergarten class and telling them straight about human trafficking. That's not what it is. It's building safe and unsafe. Like I talked about earlier, it's helping children at that age understand what is safe, how do they feel safe, when do they feel safe, what is a safe individual, what is safe touch, what is being safe online. And it builds that foundation at a young age and helps them be aware at a young age in an appropriate way. And then as they progress through school, it gives more, it helps understanding, it gets more in depth as they get older and they can understand more. Um, and we're starting to roll this program out into schools. Um, and we've had good, good support and good traction with it. We, um, with the organization we're working with, uh, partnered with another organization in Florida, it's been rolled out. Um, it, it's getting great traction, great results as it's been running for a few years there. And we're excited to take that as a way to help educate early on with children to build that foundation. And yeah, the focus is children and there's adults that are having this issue and, and whatnot, of course. But if we can build the foundation now, that kid in 20 years will be an adult and will be a better educated adult. And, uh, and that's when we're going to get systemic change is when we get these education programs in and, and actionable to children, especially, that's when we're gonna to start to make an impact on that estimated 25 million individuals who are trapped in human trafficking and stopping that cycle of individuals continuing. So this program is gonna go global. Uh, we're gonna we're, we're going to take it everywhere, but our first focus is here in the United States with this program. You know, Elizabeth, I think had to drop off for a meeting, but had a great question. How how aware are our public officials and our media of this, and what should we be doing to push our public officials to be more aware and more active? Most are, <clears throat> sorry, most are. 
Um, it just depends on their focus and who it, who it is in office at the time uh, with some of our public officials and if it's important to them or not. Right now on a federal level, there's a large group that it is important to them. And uh, in, the, in February, the Earn It Act was introduced, uh, Earn It Act, and it's, it's a, a piece of legislation that is the beginning steps to removing immunity from internet providers, website hosters for uh, CSAM, child sexual abuse material. That's where we're moving to instead of calling it child pornography. It's called CSAM. Um, so for removing the immunity from sites, if CSAM is hosted on their site. Currently, with a lot of these sites that are public sharing sites where anyone can post on it, the site themselves has some immunity of what's being posted there, and they don't have as much obligation to do something about the child pornography that's on their site. So the Earn It Act would establish a committee with all of the major players in the industry, political side, nonprofit side, internet website companies, tech companies, to discuss best practices and how we move forward to better protecting our children online. So that's a big, a big one that we can support. So you could write your local legislator, you can write uh, your representative and tell them you want them to support the EARNA Act. It passed the Senate Judiciary Committee, committee with unanimous approval and uh, will be voted on on the floor soon with everything going on in Ukraine that it's kind of taken a back seat, but um, it's passed committee in the Senate it's still in committee in the House. So it, it's in, been introduced in both, but that'll be a great piece of legislation to start the conversation about what, what we can do from a political legislative slide to protect our children more online as well. J Jacob had asked a question about, could you give a little insight into, um the signs of trafficking course that uh, that you guys offer? Yeah, so on our site, you can find under training, there's a know the signs course that dives into things that we've seen in our work. And so it'll talk about behavioral signs, emotional signs and physical signs of human trafficking and how you can spot them. Uh, and then how you can report those as well. It's about, uh, in total, maybe an hour long course with videos and questions. And then you get a little certificate at the end saying that you have completed the course. That can just be found on our website, which is ourrescue.org. Well, thanks for spending time with us. It's not a pleasant topic to talk about. It's probably not a pleasant topic for you to have to go home and think about every night but the results of what you're doing are powerful and important. And, yeah. and I know you guys are changing lives positively every time you have a chance to intervene. I think the most shocking thing to me was you said the United States is the number one market for this. We, we drive the market. We do. Yep. We're the largest consumer of, of child sexual abuse material we're, we're the, one of the largest participants in sex tourism. Uh, we are the dri one of the biggest driving factors for this on a demand side. And those are the folks we're living with and working with and seeing mm -hmm. in the grocery store every day. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. pretty disappointing. <laughs> yeah. So you got a lot, you got your work cut out for you. Yeah, we sure do, but we're doing it um, and, and we'll continue to do it, you know, even if it's just this little here and there, if we can impact one individual's life by rescuing them, or if we can impact one individual's life by sharing information that makes their parents or them aware and prevents them from ever being caught in this, that's enough. Uh, to date, we've rescued over 5,400 individuals from human trafficking and assisted in the arrests of 30, over 3,600 individuals. And we'll continue and we'll keep going. And we've educated thousands on the topic. Um, and so if you're interested in doing more, finding out more information, OURrescue.org, great place to go, get resources. There's a tab called Get Involved. 
Um, and you can click on that and learn about different ways that you can get involved from giving time. Uh, we are a nonprofit. We run off of donations. So there's the, the side for donations. There's pieces to educate yourself. There's pieces that you can share information, download uh, a flyer or brochure and send it to other people. There's uh, forms that you can submit to have a speaker like this, like myself. That's how this came to be. You know, Randy requested a speaker. We're always happy to come and present to different groups and to support the efforts that you have. Uh, it is a giant problem. It is worldwide. But the one of the best ways that we're going to fight it is individually in some ways. We, we have the name Operation Underground Railroad. We, we pay homage and we give you know credit to the original Underground Railroad and the efforts that they did in fighting slavery in their time. And human trafficking is often referred to as modern day slavery. And that's there's a connection there. And that name of the purpose in the name is is meaningful and it was purposeful in its decision when Tim picked the name Operation Underground Railroad. And one of the ways in which we learn from what they did is is telling stories is inviting others to see what human trafficking looks like and what can be done to fight it. And, you know, one of the greatest ways is what Randy did today. He has a circle or a group of people that he's already in with, he knows, he's connected with, and he can invite us in to come and share to this circle. You guys already meet, you already do this piece. And Randy said, hey, I can bring Tyson in for me on my side. I do this all the time. I can come and present easy. But if I was trying to come and get this same group of people together, it would take me months or years to do. But for Randy, it was a quick email. It was a quick, hey guys, this week we're gonna meet on this and Tyson's gonna come present. So if you have groups and circles, start there. It might be a book club. It might be something like this. It might be just your family, but start the conversation in those circles. And as we all do that, our circles will link together and we'll have that widespread awareness that we need to achieve change. Well, thanks for all you're doing and thanks for the team there and the work they're doing. This is really important and uh, we want to continue to be aware and help support what you're doing. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tyson. Thanks everyone for being here. You all have a good weekend and we'll see you next week. See you later. Bye.